Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this conference and we bless your name because you've counted us worthy to be here. You have a purpose for bringing us here, each of us. I am praying, Lord, that that purpose to equip us, prepare us, make us more effective in ministry. The purpose to put on us and to have us put on the whole armor of God. That we may be effective ministers in the kingdom in these last days. We're praying that you'll fulfill that purpose in every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you help us in our weakness. Help us in our ignorance. That we might even be wanting to hinder ourselves from being the great, effective ministers we ought to be. Lord, please, overlook our ignorance and weakness and bring us to the place where we can be totally equipped for better, greater, higher, more effective ministry in Jesus' name. Let nothing hinder us from being where we ought to be. Do it, Lord. We know you are faithful. In Jesus' name, we pray. In our Bible teaching this morning, we want to continue with the Ephesians series. And I want you to open Ephesians once again, chapter 6. I'm reading to you from verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. That she may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies, the devices, the plots, the plan, the ploys of the devil. For we wrestle not, no, against flesh and blood, against men and women, against members of our churches, against people in the community. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God, that she may be able to stand, to withstand in the evil day. And are these not the evil days? And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the best plate of righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit. Which is the watch of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Already you know we are talking about the Christian ministry. And I told you yesterday in the first message in the series. That God's word reveals that there is a great spiritual warfare. And that warfare is raging. It's been on from the beginning of the world. And it's a supernatural conflict between God and Satan. Between the angels, fallen angels of Satan and the holy angels of God. Between the messengers and agents of Satan and the people of God. Between the forces of evil and the truth of the gospel. Because we're Christians. Because we're Christian ministers. Because we belong to God. We're drawn into this spiritual conflict. God's enemy then becomes our enemy. And Satan fights God. Satan fights the plans of God. Satan fights man. Satan fights against the family. Satan fights against the church. 
Satan fights against humanity as a whole. Satan opposes the believer. And Satan opposes the church in many ways. Some of the ways in which Satan fights the church are direct and obvious. All the ways that Satan fights the church are indirect and subtle. He injects doubt into believers, into the believer's heart. Even into the, into the heart of the ministers. Billy Graham many years ago said, when he began the ministry, doubts were injected into his heart concerning the veracity, the truth, the dependability, infallibility of the Bible. And the doubt was so much in his mind that he had to go to a particular solitary place. And he placed a Bible on a log of wood there, laid his hands on that Bible, and said, I may not understand every word, everything that is said in this Bible, but from today, I commit myself to believing the whole Bible. I will wish. That he would remember that commitment he made many years ago and still be committed to the totality of the whole Bible. But Satan injects doubts into the heart concerning God's truth, concerning God's love, concerning God's plans. Concerning his power and sufficiency. He injects doubt. That if you are going to be successful in the ministry. Hey, do you think that the power of God is enough. And the plan of God is enough. And the promises of God are sufficient. He applies pressure. To cause ministers to disobey. To become unfaithful. Through temptations and persecutions. And Satan attacks us through doctrinal confusion and falsehood. He raises up criticism and, sub and suspicion. To cause division in the family and division in the church. His devices of attack are almost uncountable. Our only hope of victory in this battle that is raging is that we put on the whole armor of God. The armor we're talking about today, you find in verse 14. Look at it. Stand, therefore, having your loins got about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. I'm talking to you about the girdle of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. The girdle of truth, that's a belt of truth. Girdle means belt. The girdle of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Three divisions in the message. Three parts to the message. Number one, the battle between truth and error. The battle between truth and error. Number two, the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Number three. The best pledge of righteousness. Number one. The battle between truth and error. Ultimately, the battle between God and Satan boils down to a battle between truth and error. God is the God of truth. Deuteronomy chapter 32, reading there in verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 32, reading there in verse 4. See the description of God. It says very clearly, He is the rock. His work is perfect. All His ways are judgment. A God of, of what? Of truth. And without iniquity, just and right is he. Did you hear about Jesus Christ? Do you know what qualifies his life? Truth. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit? In John chapter 16 verse 13, it says, I'll be each when he, the Spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth. The Father, truth. The Son, truth. The Holy Spirit, truth. So, as you talk about the Holy Trinity, the Blessed Trinity, what characterizes the attribute of the of God, the Godhead, is the truth. On the other hand, as you hear about Satan, I was told in John chapter four, chapter eight, verse forty-four, "Ye of your father, the devil." And the loss of your father ye will do. For he was a murderer from the beginning. And about not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie. He speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Isn't it clear then? That the battle between the God of truth. And Satan. Who has no truth in him? The battle is actually the battle between truth and error. Satan is a liar and a father of all lies. This is one of the fundamental reasons. The great conflict. The raging warfare. Is that conflict and warfare and battle between truth and error. You know what the devil does? The devil puts up a great fight to change the truth of God into a lie. Romans. Reading then chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. In verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And worship the, and serve the creature more than the creator who is, blessed, who is blessed forever. Amen. You know the people who follow the devil. And that's what the devil makes them to do, to change the truth of God into a lie. And he endeavors to corrupt the truth concerning God. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, there in verse 17, it says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, will speak in Christ. Satan then, because of his nature, because of his attribute, because of that's his ministry, he also concentrates on error. He tries to change the truth of God into a lie. Corrupts the word of God, the truth concerning God, and the truth concerning Christ our Savior. And the truth concerning the Holy Spirit. And the truth concerning salvation. And the truth concerning life eternal. And the eternal destiny of man. That's what Satan does. To corrupt the word. The word of the Lord. He distorts the truth about grace. There are people that talk about grace and it's a distortion. And distorts the truth about love. The truth about righteousness. And the truth about relationship with God. He influences ministers who will allow him. Preachers who will allow him to call good evil and to call evil good. He leads Christians and ministers to hypocrisy and substitutes through worship. Or ceremonial worship and empty powerless traditional religion. In First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. Verses one and two. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. 
and doctrines of devils. You know devils have doctrines? And do you know there are people that were in the faith before? In the truth before? Do you know there are people who are born again before? Do you know there are people who are called into the ministry before? The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, in the last days, some, thank God, not everybody. I said, thank God, not everybody. Some shall depart. I hope you're making up your mind. You'll not be one of those people that will depart from the faith. And then, when they depart from the faith, they keep on preaching. They keep on ministering. They keep on raising up a new ministry. But they're giving it to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In verse 2, it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That they can do evil without feeling anything anymore. Uh, without even thinking about it anymore. And, you know, their conscience doesn't prick them anymore. Satan raises up many false teachers, false prophets, who misquote the scripture, who teach corruption, and they mix just enough truth with falsehood to make it seem trustworthy and believable. And there are some people you are listening to. And you listen to them and they are talking and they are talking and, they are, and you say, wonderful, this is great. But before the end, they introduce something, eject something, and then your, you know, your head begins to move and roll and say, can that be right? But you see, their congregations believe them because uh, they have truth on this area, truth on this area, truth on this area, and by the time they introduce error, the people cannot detect. Satan makes some preachers to mix just enough truth with falsehood and error to make what they are saying trustworthy and believable. He makes the false teachers to be financially successful and popular until faithful ministers begin to compromise and say, hey, why am I like this? And here I am standing on the totality of the Bible and the thing is not favoring me and uh, there is no money and there is no fame. Until those faithful ministers also, they begin to compromise and they begin to accommodate error and they convince themselves that maybe some good will come out of the evil. We must beware and we must understand that the real issue now in ministry is this spiritual battle and fight in God's armor so that we will win. I said we will win. We're going to win. You stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Stand in the strength, in the strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You cannot trust your own. Put on. The gospel armor. And watching unto prayer. When duty calls a danger. Be never wanting there. Make up your mind that you're going to fight in this battle. And truth will win. I said truth will win. If God is a God of truth. If the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. If Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. If God is greater than Satan, truth is going to win over error eventually, finally, in Jesus' name. That's why it says, put it on. The whole armor. Because the battle you're fighting is a battle between truth and error. And look at this. In John chapter 8. John 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In that same chapter, in verse 44, Jesus said, Ye of your father the devil, and the loss of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth. If you see somebody not abiding in the truth, 
that, that shows you who he belongs to. Today they'll preach salvation alone through Jesus. And tomorrow they'll preach another thing. And um, you, you need to be checking up things. Checking up things. Uh, and sometimes um, we have ministers of other churches say, I need to. I need to make you understand. Some people feel that deeper life as a church and their leader as a generous repentant, they're too much isolated. Not really. And when crusades are going on, we, you know, they come to ask us, will you participate? I said, well, if we have our own programs and Already, deeper life is a church of plan, planning, strategy, want to do this or want to do this. And sometimes from the beginning of the year, we already have our programs lined out. This will be done, this will be done, this will be done. And that's our primary assignment. And if another person comes in, in the middle of the year, suddenly, and it says, this is what he wants to do. And he says, deeper life, come on now, get involved. We say, please wait. We go back to the drawing board. And we look at our programs. And if we see that already our program will not allow us to take part in that thing, we say, this is our primary assignment. This is what God, on the final day, will ask us all. Because he is making us to watch over souls as a people that will give account. This is what I'm going to give account about. I already have a program. They say change it. I'm sorry, I cannot change it. It's primary assignment. But if they tell us long, long enough, and then we know that our programs will accommodate what is being done, fine. But even then, when people come in and they want to do this and want to do this, we check up. We find out about them. And if we find out that that minister is not standing on the truth of salvation by Christ alone, that there is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved, if he talks about Christ, and talks about this, and talks about this, Christ and, Christ and Mary, to save. Christ and, Christ and rituals, to save. Christ and, Christ and your good works, to save. We say, no, no, we cannot cooperate in that. You know, we don't want to mix truth with error. Somebody you know, wanted to come and have a program here and, and heard about me and uh, we spoke together and felt that, you know, deeper life, you know, I've heard about you, you get involved in this. I said, give me time. I said, you, you don't know me, you don't know my character, you know, don't know whether I'm fake, phony, counterfeit, how can you just, you know, trust me? He said, no, I trust you, I try. I said, okay, but I need time. And I found out. Found out from this section, from this section, from this section. And the report I got from independent sources show that it is not Christ alone. Uh, when he's in this country, he preaches it like this. When he's in that other country, whatever they want there, he preaches it like that. When he's in that other country, you know, that's another thing. So I said, I'm sorry count me out. And then to force me into it, he said, see, I have heard that you are, you don't ever cooperate with anybody. Oh, I said, you had that already? You had good information. Why are you troubling me then? Oh, he said, I'm troubling you so that you can disprove what they're saying. That you don't cooperate with anybody. I say, no, I'm not interested in disproving it. They have told you you believe it. 
I'm all right the way I am. We're not going to cooperate with everybody. We're not just going to say because you're a popular evangelist. We're going to cooperate. No. And many of you don't understand. If everybody, all of us, if we drift to one side, and the devil blindfolds every one of us, and then nobody can stand for the truth anymore, what will be the future of Christianity in Africa here? I was attending a conference as a speaker in a city, the very birthplace city of Billy Graham. And uh, the pastor drove me around. And then the, the pastor, almost with tears in his eyes, he said, Pastor Kumi, you know the, the sorrow we have? He said that he pointed to the place. That's where Billy Graham was born. He's a man, citizen, uh, some, a native of this very town. Then, in that conference, in this very town, one of the leaders rose up and said, Please, all of you in the conference will know you are here. And you know that this is the very best place of Billy Graham. He said, Please pray for him. Because now, they said it openly. They said it over the microphone. They recorded it in the cassette. They distributed the cassette. He said, because now, Billy Graham says, there's no hell fire. And when people are like that, you know, if a person like that, great, that everybody knows, will come over here to Nigeria, and you know, everybody gets together in deeper life because of what we know. If I say no, and if the deeper life overseers, if they talk to me and they say, you know, such and such is coming to our city, can they cooperate? If I say no, and some of those are overseers will even wonder, are we not carrying this into far? No, my brother, we know what you don't know. We don't want everybody to just switch to one side until nobody can speak for the truth. Until nobody can rise up and say, this is the truth of the gospel. This is the truth of Christ. And that's why we're standing the way we're standing. And we know we're on the winning side. We are on the winning side. One with God is in the majority. All the millions and billions of people in the world together, they are not equal. They are not equal in essence. They are not equal in power. They are not equal in authority. They are not equal in importance to the almighty God himself. That's why if you are a minister and you are in this battle between the truth and error, you will stand for the truth. I said you will stand for the truth. And nothing will shake you or move you away from the truth in Jesus' name. We come to point number two. The belt of truth. The belt of truth. In Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Reading there in verse 14. Stand therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth. He's using the truth there. Uh, he's looking at the, at the Roman soldier. And you need to understand that this first piece of armor that Paul the Apostle mentioned, the girdle of truth or the belt of truth, he was thinking about the costume, the dressing, the uniform of a Roman soldier. And the Roman soldier wore a tunic. If you've been looking at the pictures and the papers recently, and you will see, for example, that uh, the, the soldiers in the Middle East, uh, they don't dress like uh, the soldiers in the West. You will see that, you know, even when they're standing on their tanks and uh, Amri, you will see that uh, they have this flowing garment. That's how the Roman soldiers were in those days. The outer garment search as their primary clothing. Ordinarily, 
that clothes were hang loose over their body. And since the greatest part of ancient combat was hand to hand fighting, a loose garment was a potential hindrance and even a danger. Therefore, to get ready for battle, uh, they will bring those loose ends of the garment and tuck them in into the heavy leather belt that guarded the soldier's loins. Not only that, that girdle of belt was also used as a place where the soldier supported all his other weapons. The swordman will hang the sword from the belt. The bowman to shoot an arrow will use that same belt to support a squeaver of arrows. The Roman soldier would also pin his award medallion that is got before on the belt so that the enemy looking at him will see that medallion or will see that award and they will know that he was not fighting an ordinary soldier but a distinguished, accomplished, effective bold, courageous soldier of the Roman Empire. Now, Paul the Apostle is telling us that as the Roman soldier put on his belt, so we who are believers, who are Christians, and we are fighting in this battle against truth and error, will put on the belt of truth. And you want to understand that each piece in the whole armor is for our strength and security in the spiritual warfare. We are not to choose which pieces we prefer, but to put them all on. Because any piece of ammo that we refuse to use would leave us vulnerable and make us to be prey to the enemy. Satan's goal is to destroy our lives and ruin our ministries. To be an overcomer in life and a conqueror in ministry, each of us must personally put on every piece, every part of the armor. And you cannot wait for God to put the armor on you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine a soldier waiting for his general to fasten his helmet on him? And to tie his shoes. Can you imagine a soldier waiting for his general to tie his belt for him? No. Put it on. Put on the whole armor of God. God's eternal truth. That's our God. That's our belt. That grips all other pieces of the spiritual armor. Firm on us. As we fight to defeat the enemy of our souls. And we will defeat him. I said we will defeat him. Whatever bombardment of error and falsehood he may try to raise up, we are more than conquerors already. What do you do with this truth? How do you put this truth on seven things. Number one, know the truth. Know the truth. Know the truth, please. Number two, study. Learn the truth. Study and learn the truth. Three, choose the way of truth. The alternatives will come to you every time. You'll be at a crossroad. You'll see the way of truth here. And it may be a road filled with thorns. You will see the road of truth here. It may be a road that is rough, high, difficult, sapping energy. And then you will see the road of error on this side. Easy, convenient. But, number three, choose the way of truth. Number four, buy the truth. Whatever you have to spend, spend money, buy a good Bible. Spend money, buy a good concordance. Spend money and buy some good Bible dictionary. 
Now to show you what the Greek says, what the Hebrew says, and what's the real meaning of those words. And then buy some good, good, balanced commentaries. Spend some money. Buy the truth. Sell it not. And we have cassettes. We have literature. You'll see the, um, some of them in the program you have, but we cannot put everything there. Buy the truth. It will take some money. Buy it. Sell it not. Surprise sometimes. And somebody who might have, you know, been over here before. And I got a lot of all these cassettes and books. And, and you know it's truth. And just because it's another name now. And then he packs all the cassettes and he says, Whoever wants, come and take the cassettes. I don't need them anymore. What? I may be in disagreement with the ministry of works. Water works. I will not reject the water. I may reject the people there. I may, I may not be in agreement with everybody in Nepal. I'm not going to reject electricity because of that. I may be in agreement with that mechanic. I'm not going to be in disagreement with, you know, using mechanics and repairing my car. I may be in disagreement with the tailor. I'm not going to go naked because of that. I'm going to still wear the clothes. Who do I know even printing the Bible? What denomination of people are they? I know they must be going to church. And they may not be coming to my church. I'm not going to throw the Bible away because I don't agree with everybody in the printing press of the Bible. Buy the truth and sell it not. That a person is not worshipping inside the building, the put sign, but deeper like Bible church does not mean that you may not agree with the man there. You may not bear the name there. Buy the truth. Send it not. If you have given your cassettes to other people when you are unhappy and you didn't think well, go back to them and get your cassettes back and say, I need those things. I need those things. I need them. I need them to develop myself. Strengthen myself. Buy the truth and sell it not. Number five, speak the truth. Speak the truth. Six, walk in the truth. Seven, be established in the truth. Look at them one by one. In John chapter 8, verse 32. John 8, verse 32. And he shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Know it through and through. Don't be lazy about studying the word. Know it. Then number two to study in Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter two. Then in verse fifteen, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, properly, dividing the watch of truth. Number three is to choose that way of truth. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Bastachi, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. Choose the way of truth. Number four is to buy it and sell it not. Buy it and sell it not. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 24, verse 23. Buy the truth. Buy the truth. Buy the truth. As you come over here, you have some money with you. Can you deny yourself of Buying diabetes? Did you hear what I said? Can you deny yourself of buying diabetes? Everything is sugar, sugar, sugar. And if immediately we come out of here, you are running, you are running. You are going to buy diabetes. Can you deny yourself of buying diabetes and buying the cassettes? This thing, it will turn your ministry around. 
deny yourself. Buy the truth. Spend your money on something that will increase your power in ministry. Help you to be what you ought to be. It says, buy the truth, sell it not. Also, wisdom, instruction, and understanding. I thank God for those who appreciate the word of God. Uh, yesterday, uh, one of the overseers, a man, he was telling me, and he was saying, that women conference was great, wonderful. I said, why are you talking like that? How do you know? Were you here? Ah, he said, since they finished, I've been busy listening to the cassette. I said, what? Women conference? I said, that thing is more than for women. Then he started, you know, telling me. And I didn't tell him the way he was talking. It's like I want to go and get the cassette myself and go and listen again. He said, that thing was wonderful. I'm telling you that, you know, you ought to get all those things. Whether they call it women conference or ministers conference or whatever. Get them. It will benefit your life. I thought you would say amen. amen. Number five, speak the truth. Speak the truth. In Psalm 15. Psalm 15. And then we're reading in verse 2. Psalm 15. Verse 2. He wants us to speak the truth. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Wants to take in the word, each the word, accept the word, know the word, study the word, learn the word, choose that word. It's inside you. Speak it out. Then number 6. Walk in the truth. In Psalm 86. Psalm 86, there in verse 11, 86 verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. 7, be established in the truth. 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, here in verse 12, it tells us, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Do ye know them and be established in the present truth? That's how to put on the belt of truth. Knowing God's truth and being established in that truth is absolutely essential. For the believer and for the minister, it is battling against the schemes and, and the plans and the strategies of Satan. Without a sound knowledge of biblical teaching, he will be subject to being carried about with every wind of doctrine. And he may eventually depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devils. And eventually he may even overthrow the faith of his congregation. Be guided, therefore, with the truth. That will be of first importance in our lives. If we are not going to be conquered in life's battle and in the conflicts that face our ministries. Point number three. The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. Come back to this Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. Reading verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about your truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Put it on. The breastplate of righteousness. No Roman soldier will ever think of going into battle without his breastplate. What's the breastplate? It was a piece of armor, and sometimes made of iron, sometimes made of silver, hard metal, that covered his body from the neck to the thighs. And the purpose of that piece of armor is to protect the heart and protect the tummy 
protect the lungs and the intestines, and other vital organs of the body. The warrior without a breastplate is dangerously exposed to the enemy and could easily be killed. An arrow shot at his heart or his sword thrust into the barrels will immediately snuff out his life. It's righteousness that protects us from Satan's attacks as a breastplate protected the Roman soldier. And there is imputed righteousness which God gives to every believer at the moment he believes in Christ. But you know, what we're talking about here, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14, is not imputed righteousness because it says, put this one on. Imputed righteousness is there already and you cannot be commanded to put on what God has already imputed, imparted, and is already part of you, this one. This is talking about practical righteousness. That's the breastplate. Put it on. This breastplate of righteousness. It's an armor against our adversary. That means to live deliberately, consistently, every time to live in obedience to God's word. And it's imputed righteousness that makes practical righteousness possible. But only obedience to the watch of the Lord makes the practical righteousness a reality. If there is anything in your life, any area of your life, where the Lord is saying, Minister, servant of God, this is the way. This is the word. This is the right thing to do. If you don't do it, you're not putting on the breastplate of righteousness. When you're vulnerable to the devil, you'll be a prey to the devil. And once uh, the conscience is defiled, you're feeling guilty, and you're guilt lady, you're praying, there's guilt. Remember, remember, remember relationship with that girl. If your wife knew about that, how would she feel? Remember your sticky hand. That if money gets to your hand, there's a gum in your hand that sticks the money on your hand, church money. Remember. Remember the lie. In statistics, this is our membership right into America looking for money. And then you quote a statistics that is not right. Exaggeration. Remember. Remember the school fees of that lady you are paying in college and your wife doesn't know about it. No money, no money, no money. And you are taking church money. And you are paying the school fees of that not a girlfriend. Remember. And every time you come on the pulpit, you want to preach. If you want to knock the devil, knock sin, Satan will say, ah, ah, I'll expose you, I'll ex Then you keep, I'm sorry, master. You can't talk. You're committing adultery, fornication with somebody in a congregation. When you're reading the Bible, and you're reading about the works of the flesh, you, you, will, you will not treat it right. You will not be able to mention adultery because the person you are committing adultery with is right there in front of you and looking at you like this and doing this and say, eh, so pastor, you know there's adultery in the Bible? Okay, keep on talking. You'll keep, uh, your legs will be shaking. You'll not be able to preach. You want to cast out devils and you say, in Jesus' name, come out. And the fellow says, ah, you of all people, Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who are you? And then begins to say, uh, because, uh, don't you remember? And before the woman says, the Lord says, take this woman away. He has a mental problem. You know, it's more than a mental problem. The devil inside that person is revealing your secret. The best plate of righteousness is an important ammo that keeps you secured, preserved, protected, saved. That when the devil throws his armor, it strikes on that breastplate 
and it will never really get to you. I pray. During this conference, if anything has happened to your breastplate of righteousness and it's cracked somewhere, you make things right. I said we'll make things right. To put on the breastplate of righteousness, therefore, is to live in daily, moment by moment, obedience to our Heavenly Father. God Himself puts on, puts on us the imputed righteousness, but you must make the effort to put on that practical righteousness yourself. And that is the first plate of righteousness. Without it, you're exposed to the arrows and the darts and the attacks and the afflictions and the accusations of Satan. He'll attack your mind, your heart, your will, your emotion. And Satan fiercely will attack the Christian minister in all these various areas. But it's when you put on that practical righteousness and you put on that pure, holy life that will keep you secured so that You'll be very firm to the end. You'll be unmovable and you'll be undefeated in your life. Yet nobody will be ever able to defeat you in ministry in Jesus' name. Put it on. In Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 from verse 8. But now, ye also put off all these. There's something to put off. There's something to put on. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Feel the communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And now in verse 10, and have been and have and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Circumcision or uncircumcision. Barbarians, Kitian, bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies and kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye. And above all, and above all these things, put on, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwelling you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give it thanks to God and the Father by him. You see what he tells us there? It is something to put on a breastplate of righteousness. Practical, practical, practical righteousness. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. From verse 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. See that? And that's how you win. And that's how you become successful in ministry. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. You revenge on the devil. Never, never on man, never on man. And was clutch with zeal as a cloak according to their deeds. Accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversary, recompense to his enemies. To the islands, he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Look at this now. When the enemy 
shall come in like a flood the spirit of the lord shall lift up a standard against him if you put on the armor and the truth is operating in your life and there's no hypocrisy and there's no deception and your life is totally a symbol a beacon of light showing the way to the truth and then this righteousness is really in your life in your heart you put it on and what people see is that righteousness you know when the enemy comes in like a flow the spirit of the living god is going to raise up a standard against him in first thessalonians chapter five first thessalonians chapter five verse eight but let us who are the day be sober putting on the best pledge of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation and then in verse 15 it says see that none render evil for evil unto any man this practical righteousness you cannot be in this world and not see a little evil and not be confronted with a little evil and not have a little evil thrust at you of course you're in the world that's that's the world that's the world they're going to offend you they're going to do evil against you but practical righteousness is that you will not render evil unto, for evil unto any man unto your leader in your church if you are under another leader or unto your subordinates in the church if you are leader over other leaders unto you know any man he opposes you because you know he, he just voiced out his opinion in that committee and he was saying his mind not with any malice that's the way he knows how to talk although he's not talking perfectly but that's all he knows you will not train that evil unto evil for any man or it may be to unbelievers outside <laughs> you know sometimes you're surprised a minister is going on the road and these uh, you know police people they're doing their work and they are supposed to you know check this and that and then they stop you and they say where is the evidence you own the car where is this where is this and you refuse to bring those things out they say park your car here and as they say that you say do you know who i am <laughs> who are you you're a citizen in our country and in these days who can you trust ministers carry hard drugs too ministers also deal with cocaine if you are not carrying cocaine if you don't have any exhibit they say bring your paper very gently you bring it out and if uh, after you bring it out oh they say oh, you're a minister you say yes i am oh we are sorry to stop no don't be sorry you are doing your work encourage them rather than after they have stopped you and maybe you feel that they didn't do right then you begin to say you you stop me like that i am so and so and you begin to curse them is that a minister see that none render evil for evil unto any man but follow after that which is good both among yourselves and to all men and in verse 21 of all things hold fast that which is good abstain from all appearance of evil in Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 reading there from verse 24 and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Not false holiness. Not holier than thou holiness. 
not superficial holiness, not holiness in the day, adultery in the night, not holiness in church, and fighting for the wife at home, true holiness. That's the armor, the armor of righteousness, breastplate of righteousness. Verse 25, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Please, uh, don't give a skill on this and say, uh -huh. the Bible says be angry. And then you are angry against your congregation, against your family. Against people in the bus, against people everywhere, be angry at sin, not at the sinner. Be angry at evil, not at the evil doer. For the evil doer, for the sinner, you have pity, you have pity. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. But when you fight sin, fight sin. With righteous anger, righteous indignation. Not the sinner, not the sinner, not the sin. Never, never fight man. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Then it says in verse, in verse 27, it says, Neither give place to the devil. When you do things that are not right, you are giving place to the devil in your ministry. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather, let him labor, walking with his son, practical holiness, practical righteousness, breastplate of righteousness. Let him labor with his son, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. If there is anyone, any minister, that should be very careful about this righteousness we are talking about, shouldn't it be the Pentecostal preachers? They are supposed to talk about the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost every time. Grieve not that Holy Spirit of God. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. What does that mean? That all bitterness, all bitterness. How can you tell us you are Pentecostal, you are speaking in tongues, and you have the gifts of the Holy Ghost, and bitterness, bitterness is there. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice. Can you imagine ministers, Holy Ghost uh, preachers, not greeting one another? Bitter, angry, malice. Can you imagine ministers even believing the same doctrine, standing on the same truth? Can you imagine ministers in the same denomination? Can you imagine ministers in the same Conference, I don't mean conference like this. Hating one another. And they cannot see one another face to face. And they cannot be friends. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, evil speaking, evil speaking be put away from you, far away from you, that it will never come back again in Jesus' name. With all malice, all malice methodical malice quiet malice uh, there's something they call cold war malice put it away and I'll be kind one to another tender hearted forgiving one another as God forgiving one another I have forgiven uh, have I not forgiven I have forgiven which as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's the armor. We'll put it on this morning. Rise up and put it on.